Welcome and welcome to Monarchism Unfiltered. I'm one of your hosts, Mikosk. I'm I am. And this is me, Bronze. And on today's episode, we'll be talking about the relation between the Habsburg dynasty and art. So, um, Bronze, you were you were specifically saying about um, the use of art to establish uh, to establish the the Habsburgs as a dynasty. Um, and I was wondering what what uh, specifically you, you had in mind there. Uh, so there's several uh, things that, that are coming to to mind. Um, the first thing would be if we go back uh, to the fifteen fourteen or oh, um, late for late fifteenth uh, early sixteenth century. Uh, when we're talking about the last knight, Maximilian the uh, second, so because he he built he was very adept at the use of soft power, you know. Essentially, he consolidated power in his uh, in in the in the realms that he controlled through uh, you know. Donations of wood carvings and paintings and so forth that would establish the the House of Habsburg going back in history and establishing them also now. So there's the thing I think we talked about it in episode five, which is the massive sort of uh, wood wooden carved uh, palisade at at, the, at Innsbruck depicting the eighty. Saints of the House of Habsburg. So that's that's one example. For example, you know, another example. I I also think from Maximilian II is that he had a, his own walking propaganda piece in uh, in style of uh, of a gargantuan tapestry that he basically put a place everywhere he went because uh, under Maximilian II, the court was still mobile. We, even though he was like responsible for like a tremendous increase in like court bureauc bureaucracy compared to previous uh, Holy Roman administrations. So was this also sort of associated with like um, propaganda efforts almost of like the association, especially when you were discussing about um the saints of the house of habsburg um where would that not almost be connected with this idea of uh divine legitimacy um yeah definitely but i i, th I think what makes the habsburgs special if not unique is how good they were at using art to achieve this yeah, because for example, while we're talking, while the Habsburgs will be the main focus of this episode, there will be digressions. Yeah, for example, there is a good example that precedes the Habsburgs, uh, uh, the house of um, the house of Barbarossa, uh, Barbarossa himself, but his house in general, uh, embarked on what could only be seen as a, a, a campaign to like recapture Charlemagne from the French back to the Germans, basically. Because, I mean, it's difficult to explain now because nowadays, like, Charlemagne is seen as, like, both French and German at the same time. But back then, it wasn't really the case. In the 10th century, the, the France, the Kingdom of France and the French people, well, the French aristocrats, saw themselves as a more legitimate and direct continuation of Charlemagne and, Char and his empire than the, uh, than the Holy Roman Empire. It was really with the Barbarossa's house that you start to see the first uh, efforts of, of like recasting Charlemagne as German basically. So the, and this was achieved via again, publication, well not publications, but like commissions, ministrels, uh, a lot, a lot of church building and church decoration. You, uh, use of art in a propagandic, in a propagandistic sense. Sure. But it was really the Habsburgs who elevated it to like an art form in of itself. Well, so I mean, instantly, first thing I should point out uh, is that Carol de Hruta, uh is Dutch, not French or German. Um, secondarily, that important clarification out of the way, um, I think that 
the interesting point there that you made about um like who like the ethnic identity is probably the wrong word but sort of uh with whom the um with whom charlemagne is identified uh like be that the king of france or the holy Roman empire um is quite important with regards to like um control over over uh uh like lothringen like the whole region of Lo- uh, lothringen so if you you know the classical division between like um between france lothringen germany which was kind of the essentially the the you know yeah. I mean, that's when you get burgundy from there and the division of that that burgundy comes, burgundy come, comes from like the kingdom of burgundy like the duchy comes from the old kingdom but yeah that, but, but uh, i'm, I'm not, talking about like i'm not disagreeing you just just here to qualify to the listener when uh, when uh, when I am saying Lotharingian, he's referring to the territory of the kingdom of Lotharingia, and more to the point, uh, he, he especially as time go, goes on, he's referring specifically to Lower Lorraine versus Upper Lorraine. Well, uh, wait, uh, sw- switch that. Lower Lorraine, no, Upper Lorraine versus Lower Lorraine. Uh, Lower Lorraine is to the north. Upper Lorraine is to the south because the naming was based on river flow and not actual cardinal direction. But yeah. Uh, he is true. Like claim, the, the uh, literal descent from Charlemagne and institutional continuation from Charlemagne were used in the border disputes, but after the breakup of um, Lotharingia, down the, as as recent as uh, nineteen, uh, as as recent as World War One. Mm. So I mean, also with with the Habsburgs um, and this use of, of the Habsburg equivalent of this. Would be the the claiming to uh, that you know uh, the claim to you know being the descendants of Leopold the Illustrious. Yeah, the uh, what what he was he he was grandson of Charlemagne, wasn't he? Or like what? Uh, sorry, I what don't know if he? he was you know, but he was a big important figure that was then heavily mythologized as sort of like this founding figure of Austria, which is why the Austria started having the. The red, white, red banner, which is the banner of Leopold. Yeah, of House Babenberg. Yeah, but he was in the the tapestries and wood carvings of, among others, Maximilian II, depend, depend, uh, depicted as the founder of the Habsburgs, among other things. Interesting. So, yeah, the relations was. Again, all, this is still sidetracking massively, but yeah, the relationship of the House of Habsburg had with the House of Babenberg is quite interesting because for centuries, the code, their coat of arms was the coat of arms of House of Babenberg. It's fairly rare to see a new house just straight up take the exact same coat of arms. You, in fact, only see the return of the Austrian lion, of the Habsburg lion, in fact, uh, the, red, uh, the red lion on a yellow background. Uh, has a in, in uh, never as the coat as the center of the coat the arms uh, uh, never again, but as a supporter or as like the uh, or on the top bit of the shield whose name escapes me. So uh, yeah, their relationship is the relationship between these two houses is oft is is in of itself also f- very unique as far as medieval Europe is considered. That that is quite interesting. Um, so in terms of this, like combination of um various claims to dynastic descent and then also um pi- like claims about piety by the um by the Habsburgs um what do you think sort of specifically set the Habsburgs apart from um from other from other dynasties in the in how Good, they were at um, doing this kind of propaganda. If I if if I if I were to take a wager, they were um, because we have to understand that we're not talking about house and the reality of being part of an aristocratic house, especially in the medieval ages to the Renaissance to around the 1700s, was not quite different. Was quite different than what we now back than what we project back then. 
because the notion of house, the identity of being part of a house was much more recent than people think. I mean, most people think that heraldry was like a thing from the 900 or early 10th century. The first bit of heraldry we have in any reliable sense was that of the Kingdom of Leon, and that was basically 12th century. Um, so, that, that, so the notion of, so if I were to wager this, is that the House of Habsburg, and we have again in part due to the extreme metalizations, in part due to to their need to their need to emphasize continuation from the House of Babenberg since a very early age, uh, is that is that they were perhaps amongst the first dynasties and houses to actually see themselves as a collective, basically, and think and and, uh, and thinking as if they were part of a collective, which was the House of Habsburg. This mean this meant that although they were not unique in trying to in trying to use art as a propaganda tool, they were more effective because they saw themselves as a, as a single unit, and their and their art and their art referred to him uh, to refer to them as a single unit, and they behaved as that was the case, which kind of goes a, a, a long a good long way into enforcing into like encouraging and enforcing that the effectiveness of uh, the, of that type of propaganda. So, so you, could um, even, you could even say that l'état c'est maison de Habsbourg. Sorry, so would you... I, I find that quite interesting as to they were one of the first groups um, of aristocrats to see themselves in a sort of dynastic fashion. Um, well, the earliest one we have conclusive evidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But do you, do you know... Do you, do you know of like any specific reason as to why why the Habsburgs in particular had um, this greater sort of self identity uh, than say oh, other dynasties? Oh, it's, it's fairly it's it's actually fairly hilarious when you consider about it because many people think that the Habsburgs were started as Austrian. That's false. They started as Swiss. In fact, the castle of Habsburg, or Habsburg, the castle of the hawk, is in fact part is in fact currently in Switzerland, obviously. But in fact, the revolt against an early, early Habsburg count is part of Swiss national foundational myth, basically. So you have to understand that when the Habsburgs got uh, the Dutch, uh, as as far as I'm aware, right, that count's name was Leopold, and then it was a different Leopold, but then there was sort of like, somehow in the in the mythologies, the two Leopolds blended together. So you have, so, because you have to understand that one that, ha that they went from what is barely above a Castellan, and they lost the castle, obviously, uh, and, and their early rivals with the Zeringen, with the House of Zaringen, in uh, Monde Suavia, you have this almost irrelevant, obscure house all of a sudden comes into power of one of the, not the biggest, but one of the bigger duchies in the Holy Roman Empire, and their pedigree is absolutely disastrous to begin with. What do they do? Identification uh, identification with the previous dynasty, the Bauernberger, and a kind of bizarre siege mentality uh, that um, that that kind of permeated the dynasty that over time became self identification within of its with the dynasty itself amongst the individual members. You also have a lot of uh, you also have a lot of unique things like privilegium Maius, how they literally forged the title of archduke into existence. How with time every member of the House of Habsburg started being referred as an archduke, even if they weren't a literal archduke. So you have a lot, it was, it was a small collection of, um, it was basically happenstance at the beginning that laid the foundations to be there. Yeah, it was a happenstance that Rudolf came to be uh, Holy Roman Emperor because a lot of people, there was, there was not many good candidates and people wanted a really weak Holy Roman Emperor. And so, you know, this, this weird, obscure count from Switzerland that they, they, had literally lost all his land due to a peasant revolt. Yeah, the, so there was a revolt, and then he was also excommunated because he got really angry and he burnt down a monastery, but then he was let back into the church after he paid for its rebuilding. It's a bit... 
and then and then he somehow becomes Holy Roman Emperor, uh, wins a war on, uh, on Bohemia, and then manages to secure himself the title of Duke of Austria, and eventually King of Bohemia as well. Yeah, yeah, that that's a bit later, but yeah. I mean, in terms of like a comeback story, that's quite like you know. Um, comeback story like i think that's a pretty good reason to presuppose that you are like divinely favored in some in some fashion uh you know if you've gone from like less than nothing really uh so was he excommunicated at the time that he was made emperor yeah this was early in his life this was uh, many yeah. years before the he became emperor he was Excommunicate. That that was before the peasant revolt, also. That was. Yeah. So I mean, that yeah, that is quite. Um, I would see that that can be like the quite obvious reason for like this uh, self identification. If you've. Um... And also, yeah, yeah, and you know, in the, the, you know, in the later on in the in medieval period, as as Mikhail mentioned, there was the privilegium, uh, maios, which was sort of special privileges ground granted to the house and. Um, De jure, the justifications for this what was uh, largely invented historical legacies of the House of Habsburg. Interesting. I mean, I think would you would you say that there is like um, that the art that they used did help to create um, a lot of this like self identification with with the dynasty, especially if you're saying that like. Um, there's sort of mythologization of these Leopolds, conflation, so on and so forth. Because like that would imply to me at least that the art that was used was in part used um, by the house itself to give itself this this self-identity, um, you know, as as descending from Babenberg and, and so on and so forth. To a large degree, though Yeah, I, I think I think it's it's in a sense it's a symbiotic re- relationship. So that you know the self-identification with dynasty inspires art and then it, it is cultivated by the art. So the two feed off of each other. Perhaps that was not the original intention, but it without a doubt just became the fact. It's it's kind of hard to not see yourself as a Habsburger when you're in your church and your church is literally decorated and filled to the brim with things of the glory of the house. Kind yes. Of- so there's the sort of There, I, I, you could, you could say that the, the in in the history of the Habsburgs and their relationships to art, there are three main uh, phases. Which the early phase, which you could say is uh, count, uh, hold on, is Ma- you know Maximilian, the, you know, talking about you know the heraldic nature of Habsburg art. Then I'd say there's sort of the art of the Habsburg court in the sense that, uh, you know, the, the Habsburgs, you know, in, in in the early modern period, you know, six, six, uh, 16th, 17th centuries had a high emphasis of, you know, art and stuff in their court. And, for example, Charles V uh, used a lot of art to sort of empower his newly created order of the golden fleece and uh, well he didn't create it but it was it was new by the time that he he inherited it and so he you know there's the famous painting of him by titian sort of de- depicting him as sort of like this christ-like warrior and so that was and then towards the end there was the, the the emphasis shifted a bit from the the Habsburgs themselves to the the city of the Habsburgs, Vienna, where you know Vienna at the time was the leader of culture in Europe. You know, it was the city of musicians, the city of painters, until the twentieth century, really. And they and they played a you know a big part in that. You know, lavishing huge sums of money on the opera and so forth, and hosting all the great composers. But, for example, to give an example of Habsburg courtly art, especially late Habsburg courtly art, you have the um, you have the famous, uh, well, not famous because it isn't a particularly lauded painting, but the pop, but the common the depiction of Charles um, 
the first of the the first uh, the Ch Charles the first Austrian emperor. The I don't remember his exact number uh, numeral. The first Austrian emperor, last uh, last Holy Roman emperor. Basically, there, there is a there is a very there is a very important painting of him that to, to now they to, to Francis. Yeah, Fra not Charles Francis. Jesus Christ, my name. Charles the first of the you know well, that was uh, the last one. The last yeah. Um, damn. Yeah. So the basic idea of the painting, it's very interesting, is that he is, is he's sitting basically front uh, to the to the to the look to the onlooker, surrounded by his close family, and this is in direct contravention to the paintings of say Napoleon, of say his generals or or most of the contemporaries who, pre who presented themselves as basically warriors uh, of the age, uh, mighty generals, august emperors. And you have this painting of Charles, which is him basically as a family man. And this was kind of official state portraiture of a man. Because again, oh, because again, some people might be unaware of this, though perhaps the British, the British people do know, like, it was pretty common back then, in fact, state policy to hand out like small portraits or bigger ones, if you're willing to pay, um, uh, of, the, of the sovereign and his family. And uh, this painting was a deliberate choice by him, basically. So even in the early, in the very early 1800s, you see already a kind of, I don't want to say ideology per se, but you, you start to see that uh, art for the Habsburg starts rapidly taking an ideological connotation to it. Though, in terms of art as an expression of ideology, I wouldn't say the Habsburgs were particularly successful, all things told. But they can, again, be counted amongst the earliest possible adherents to this vision. Yeah, uh, uh, I, th I think, I think fr you know, the, the Francis, I think, represents sort of the, you know, like the transitional between the courtly and Viennese phases. Because, the, the, you know, Vienna as sort of the city of great art was already coming more into the limelight under Joseph and uh, Maria Theresia. But then he sort of, he was a bit of a, the last outlash of the courtly, but with a high focus, you know, he's in, in he was also among that painting, but also other paintings of him, you know, walking the streets of Vienna and greeting the people were handed out. Again, again, we're not saying the monarchs did give out full body portraits to scale to people, but smaller ones they did. Don't start quoting us on here that the old monarchs start, gave, freely gave uh, glorious pieces of art to their people as as a as a edification process that only started later, and sadly didn't last long. Yeah, you know, they were like s s small frame prints or lit lithographies. But yes, now um, I mean we're, we're kind of jumping a bit on, on both the early on the heraldic on the heraldic dominated period and the courtly period, and moving right on to the Viennese period. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, and this that, this is just the the Austrian Habsburgs. The ah, God, uh, the. You see, you see this with the Spanish Habsburg. Well, I wouldn't say it was particular. I don't know who commissioned this, but uh, which branch of the Habsburg commissioned this. But there is a somewhat obscure nowadays image of Europa uh, as a woman, basically. Uh, the, the painting is a bit weird because I think they render the boot of Italy as an arm, and I always found that like an absurd, an absurd turn of an absurd uh, way way to represent it because rather than it, because rather than being as one expected, it's like sideways, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, it was clearly like Vienna was the heart, give or take, and Spain was the head. Hence, why I think this was perhaps uh, the Spanish Habsburgs commissioning this. But you, the Spanish Habsburgs usage of art was always in the uh, was always a lot more universal. Basically, they were. It was all the idea of the Spanish, the the sun doesn't set on the Spanish Empire super moony kind of deals their identification with the dynasty at least to me as far as i'm aware is not as prevalent but i will openly admit that i am ignorant being portuguese and the habsburg dynasty of the iberian union not being particularly well remembered over the on this side of the peninsula so um i think 
it's quite interesting that what was used there was the metaphor of uh, heart and head, or um, body and head, um, at least because obviously that <clears throat> brings forth um, imagery of like marriage and so forth. Um, but I think the other thing to be to be remembered or considered there is that um, for the like the these people would still have been Aristotelians basically um, in biology. Um, and the assumption was in Aristotelian biology that uh, the heart was the center of um, the the center of um, of sensation and like motion. Um, whereas the head was essentially just like um, a thing used to cool the body because the the heart gave off like vital fire and then the head, uh, cooled the body so as to prevent the the body from burning, essentially. Um, and here it is. I, I found. I, I actually found the specific image, and yeah, I'm happy. I, I did not mistake it, but yeah, it's it still has. Um, yeah, yeah, Vienna, Vienna slash Bohemia uh, uh, as the near the center which back then people still thought the heart was like in the center this is like a we, we will link it in the in the video description because uh europa regina here it is you, yeah, can, yeah. you can you can look it up but uh we will link it in the video description so yeah the, the point that i wanted to make then is that um you should be hasty um you should be cautious to interpret the metaphor of um head to mean control um because head does not mean control head means um like cooling um because for like Ari for aristotle and most people at the time there was no there was no concept of like um a of a like seat of rationality um it's not until like um it's not until descartes really that you get people advocating for the concept of like uh, a seat of consciousness um aristotle and so forth essentially just posited that um consciousness intelligence so on and so forth was an attribute of the of the entirety of the body um, and the way that he reasoned this was essentially just that, like, if you lose an arm, you can no longer, like, feel the arm, so on and so forth. Um, so it might not actually, anyway, long story short, it might not actually be then a position of Spanish supremacy to have Spain as the heart or to have Spain as the head. Um, it might just be, like, I mean, it could even be like pro-German because um, Spain as the head means that it's like the the regulating organ, not not like like a, the brain for Aristotle is less important than the heart. Um, so, or equally important, the uh, the head in general that is because like. You can lose your eyes, but if your heart is punctured, you just die. So, yeah, so, yeah well, I would be hasty to interpret that, or I'd be cautious to interpret that in the way that you interpreted it there. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, I, 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 I think the, you know, I, I think it's in you know, about how you know they go together. They're sort of a, you know, you got to have them both. Yeah. Um, Austria and Spain. Yeah, especially because like, so is it is it Austria at the center? Is that Bohemia? That says oh, Bohemia. Right? It's in some in some it's Bohemia, in others uh, in others it's Vienna, literally below it. But yeah, from what I've read, this was like Charles the. Uh, let me let me go check again. Yeah, Charles the fifth. 
Uh, yeah, it, it was basically a thing that Charles V uh, did to like emphasize that he, that by this point he was now a Holy Roman Emperor and King of Spain, and was thereby nearly, or as far as would ever be possible, to become the universal emperor of Europe. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting to see what he, because this is sort of vaguely geographical. Um, if you look at it. Uh, the boot of Italy is in fact an arm. <laughs> mm. It's interesting how small Asia is. Um, Maybe that's just a bit of Asia poking through? It's, it's, um, it's like... It's Anatolia. It's Anatolia. Yeah, well, Anatolia is uh, Asia, like Asia, Asia. It's like Asia Minor is Anatolia, Asia Major is, is uh, the Levant. We got horrible... Yeah. Tracked. <laughs> yeah, but that's you know it's you know this this is this is a bit of a sidetracky episode, but that's fine. Anyway, um, that that art itself is actually quite interesting. I think just in terms of what it um, what it characterizes is like the the crown, um, because it's it's also not like it doesn't have north as as. Like the cardinal direct uh, as like the cardinal direction, it has the east, no, the west. Um, yeah, so that's also, yeah, that's it. That's quite interesting that because you've got another version there. I think, um, and again, there's uh, Spain as, as the crown. Um, interesting stuff. I think, yeah, in terms of this, like, specific art, um, I think it is quite interesting that, um, so you're saying this was made by, the, by like, people associated with the Habsburgs. Um, Apparently, as far as I can ascertain, this was, like, these two were, like, commissioned, or at least this style of representation started with Charles V. Mm. So... so like, the crown, I'm willing to believe that later versions were like commissioned by the Spanish Habsburgs, but uh, that's just supposition at this point. So, with this, um, what do you like? I, I think it's it, these kinds of um, this kind of imagery, I think, is quite interesting, um, in terms of, of what it tells us about like how people saw the world because I think quite clearly these are not intended to be. Uh, you know, accurate merchant maps. Um, but it, I think it is quite interesting that there's this emphasis upon the unity of Europe as portrayed through um, through this, like, metaphor of the body. Um, especially because places like Ireland and Spain or Ireland and England are kind of explicitly ex excluded <clears throat> in a certain sense. And you, you can see this with uh, Scandinavia, Norway, uh, Muslim world as well. But there is like, especially a, a kind of organic unity being posited for uh, most of the Mediterranean. Um, so I, I think it is, that is in itself quite interesting. Um, and you, you're also posting these images by uh, bronze. You're posting images by like uh, King uh, Emperor Francis. Uh, the, yeah, I'm just uh, yeah, I'm just posting some images that we were talking about earlier, but and so that we can put them in. The, we're going to put them in the show notes. Yeah, yeah, that'll be good. Um, yeah, we're not good enough to actually put them on the video. Oh well, yeah, yeah, um, no, but uh, everywhere doesn't have video. Yeah, so I, mean, I, I, I could put them in the video, but. It's a podcast. Uh, I find it interesting video. that in with Francis sitting, he does not actually have the world in his hand. He has it. Um, the world is off to the side. Um, he just has the the royal scepter. I wonder what the meaning of that could be. Because I mean, he also has the sword next to him. Um, isn't this the one from when he? Because he was the doppelkaiser, wasn't he? He was. Um, yeah, this this is this is this is his inaugural portrait as emperor of as Holy Roman Emperor. Mm. Not the one I was thinking of, of of him with his family, but it it is close enough in like its frontality. 
the 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 one of him and the Viennese is quite interesting, just because of how like uh, healthy the Viennese are portrayed as. Like, if you look at the Viennese, that very sort of, you know, and there's this like gaggle of girls in white and stuff. And I mean, obviously, white. They've all got flowers in their hair, and they look plump. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. look plump. Um, yeah, white itself is very hard to wash. Um, yeah, I just, I just, you know, it's, 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 uh, yeah, I just, you, you don't imagine them painting the, the emaciated freezing masses. And they do that for for um, Napoleon's retreat, but obviously that's slightly that was by uh, by Russians, wasn't it? I think. Um, but yeah, you <laughs> independent. Yeah, this this is this is this is a state commissioned painting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this this was hung everywhere and stuff. So they made replicas of this, and then would um, yeah, simplified replicas and prints and stuff. Would they do the same for Francis Sitting? I imagine so, seeing as it's a coronation picture. Those usually. <laughs> so would they use these kinds of paintings as, um, for like propaganda purposes? Yes. And 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 you know also the the the, the patronage of, of who would paint something like this was was a whole political operation in and of itself. You know there, there were various factions of painters and you know based on how it was it was a bit it's a bit complex but yeah. So would you sort of um, would it be a case of like oh I suggest my student you suggest yours. Um, kind of thing, and then we tried to lobby the prime prime minister or whoever to 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 choose. Yeah, or you know, oh my, the brother, you know, my brother, the prince of whatever, has been doing really good. So I'll I'll have one of his house painters do it, or the equivalent thereof. Um, yeah, I think I think this is. Yeah, and, and 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 you can tell how much the the Habsburg emperors and so forth cared about art because. They wrote a lot of they they there's so, there's so many laws that are about like oh no ballet in the opera yes ballet in the opera operas are only supposed to be this long this short like you know official state laws you know governing this sort of stuff they spent a lot of time thinking about this. Do you think that was um, explicitly all propaganda, or do you think it was like a, a, a court cultural thing of? Um, extreme emphasis on art i i, I think i think as, as after a certain point they started seeing it as their job to sort of cultivate good art it was it was it was definitely you know some more than others for example um, uh, you uh those those of you in the audience who have seen the film amadeus which is uh not that historically accurate but good film will know that joseph the second was the musician king And so he he cared a lot about it. That is quite interesting. Um, was he actually a dullard, as they portray in the film? Because he, he in the film he's portrayed uh, in Amadeus he's portrayed as being quite stupid. Um, at least from what I sort of gathered from the film. Yeah, he's. Uh, so so how that's that's there's many conflicting stories about you know what he was actually like, but but some accounts say that he was. At the very minimum, highly impulsive and not and not and not exactly the most forewarned of persons. Since, if if I'm not mistaken, my Josephs, he accidentally spawned Belgium. Yeah, I'm not sure how accidentally that could be, but um, I thought I, that is quite very interesting that um, that they were so aggressively interested in art. Um, I mean, the only thing I could think that's like comparable, at least in the UK, is probably like. Um, uh, King Charles the First, yeah, possibly the second. Yeah, the, the Stuarts were generally quite concerned with art. Um, obviously, this has like a lot of propaganda benefits, but um, I, I was sorry, I was interested in terms of the with the actual like rise to power of the of the House of Habsburg. Um, so you said about like he becomes he becomes uh leopold the the is it leopold the first 
Um, Rudolph. Okay. Rudolph. Is the yeah. one that becomes the... Hello. Yeah. Yeah. So he's exiled from Switzerland, becomes Holy Roman Emperor, um, and then he, then then what is it then a case that he gets uh, the Duke, Duchy of Austria, and then finally, and then later on, they become like kings of Bohemia and massively expand territory. Uh, come kings of Hungary, so on and so forth. Well, in in the in the in the thirteenth century, they weren't Holy Roman emperors continuously yet. And so what? So I, I think because I don't, I as uh, this, this I might be wrong about this, but I don't think his son was um, his Holy Roman emperor. His the so the, they're they're sort of on and off Holy Roman emperors with increasing frequency. Because a lot of people find having a Habsburg emperor convenient at first, because they're not that powerful, right? But every every one adds a little bit to the to the to the domains. I would also guess that the other advantage is that uh, they're relatively obscure. Like even once they become like uh, you know they have this massive domain in Eastern Europe. Um. Like it's not particularly easy for them to just like invade Hanover or whoever. Yeah, and another thing is uh, is that a massive portion of that uh, domain, uh, Hungary, for example, was not actually part of the Holy Roman Empire, which made it very difficult for the Habsburgs to historically get the help of other German princes to defend, like Hungary or any of their extra imperial possessions. Because the Germans are sort of, you know. Uh, backwards schemey lot um, but yeah I mean I think that is quite interesting that um, yeah so another, maybe I think that could be a reason why there's such a focus on uh, dynasty because essentially the empire isn't built all in one go it's you know it's not a oh he fights a war gains a massive bit of land sun comes along he might lose a war you know it's it's every every emperor through some marriage or privilege gained in the diet adds a little bit to the empire or a little bit to the rights of the house of habsburg was it was it um sorry especially with that rights of the habsburg thing was it actually a legal privilege that they were the only possible roman uh, successor was, was that like did that um, or was it just like by convention? I, well, I, well, they are say it's a mixture of both, but yeah, essentially, it it became a sort of de facto. These are the the emperors now, but the the, the privileges themselves were mostly concerned with sort of extra rights to taxations or dues paid to them upon coronation by other princes. Famous and absurd, and uh, and uh, an absurd level of this is that again, going back here to Francis. He uh, he received what was it like two pigs from Saxony as ancient and immem- uh, tribute for, since time immemorial. Like uh, like a, a, a lot of these quote unquote privileges to this day se- seem like a bit absurd and minute, but back then it made a difference. Well, I, I would guess the two pigs thing is probably also just like purely symbolic, even from the beginning. Probably, but still, yeah. And it, yeah, in the, and also in their sort of um, uh, demands, they were they they were often quite a bit uh, old-fashioned. For example, there's a there's a when uh, the Frederick, oh, which Frederick is it? It's the only Habsburg Frederick, I think who is crowned in 1453. Uh, I think I think it's from him on that they're emperors continuously. They uh, he's also he's the sole Habsburg to be crowned emperor in Rome. And upon his journey to Rome he makes the pope sign this document right where the pope has to concede all these privileges to him. But these are the sort of privileges that no one cares about by 1453. 
but something that you know would have been a massive victory in like in 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 eleven fifty, if that makes any sense. It's a so what could you give an example of some of those? Or like, do you not right, like b- before he, the, he the the pope places the crown on his head, he has to kneel in front of the the new emperor or something. It's like it's not like you have to, he has to pay him money. It's 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 all ceremonial stuff that like rec- you know, that was had like major implications in the high middle ages, but by this point don't really matter. Like when you know there was the whole like who gets to who gets to appoint bishops thing. You know, he doesn't get to appoint bishops, but he gets to say that he's allowed to or something. It's a bit weird. I mean, I mean, we have to remember that this is like, although I don't think this is particularly the height of the Spanish ceremonial, which, by the by, wasn't actually Spanish to begin with, but because it, uh, because again, it predates the, uh, it actually predates the the, uh, the Habsburgs acquiring Spain. It was actually a naturally emergent part of like the increasingly more and more ritualized. Uh, Th- I would say this is the beginning of it. Frederick Fred- is the. Is is the sort of the beginning of the Habsburg art thing? He he's the one that really expands the the privilegium and and instills in his son how important it is. And his son is the the pre well, he's Maximilian the first, and he starts building a lot of tapestries and being knightly. And then his his son Maximilian the second is then the peak of Habsburg heraldic art. Yeah, it uh, again it's. Yeah, are they unique in, be, in 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 being a dynasty that tries to like associate themselves with art and the like? No, but they are without a doubt the most successful. I mean, it is quite interesting, um, especially with regards to like their uniforms. Like, I would very much associate them like the Austrians with like white. Um, and is there? Do you know of any like particular reason why they why they? Because they they like you know Francis. Um, like he sat on the gold of like the Holy Empire, but he himself is dressed in white in that Francis sitting um, thing. And it, is that just like a flex because of how like how expensive it is to to clean white, or, or was there like a deeper symbology to to their association with white? Yes, there is. In fact, um, it's not Habsburg specific. It's association with the symbology of white. I mean, you see this in a lot of early Iberian flags uh, in which it's just the coat of arms and a field of white until, in the case of Portugal, the white was still was was still like an important part of the flag until like uh, the 1910. The, the, the issue is this, this ha- it has a strong connotation with the Catholicism and like the notion of a Catholic monarch as like a bastion of peace, basically. Him being dressed in like, say, white in both the coronation and like even the... Um, and even the and even the fact that the field marshal uniform of the royal of the imperial Austrian army was like white until like very well, until the empire dissolved, I guess, um, was uh, was it the- yeah, but yeah, but you know the the soldiers themselves had white uniforms, not not the- uh, by the end. By the end, they'd they'd gone but, blue. But yeah, the white it was it was like a manifestation. When that was created, that painting, they were white. Uh, uh, again, uh, that has to do with, like, in a symbolic level, it's basically that, like peacekeepers, basically. Austria. Yeah, and it's Aust- Austrian was never was never a country. I mean, I believe one of their emperors, uh, in fact, said uh, Austria has no great brain for war, and the in the infamous uh, saying "I or U," which is uh, all the world will one day be of Austria, uh, and the saying, "While others make you uh, war, you happy Austria make marriage." So there is yeah, a, by uh, Matthias, Matthias Corvinus, king of Hungary, who is who is involved in sort of an art war and then and then some some real war with Maximilian. The um, so yeah, the choice of white, uh, especially for like the troops, was one third convention because uh, that uh, pretty much all started with this, but uh, also the Austrians keeping it uh, and making it our thing. Um, was definitely like uh, had uh, had like different symbolical meanings. Yeah, and it's interesting that that you you point out because it reminds me of um, another point of similarity with um, 
Charles the First, who is, is often referred to as the White King, for having been coronated in white robes, although uh, which which is actually not true. He was coronated in the same uh, white robes with a sort of a red robe on top that his father was. But he has he gains the repute in posterity. He is romanticized as having been coronated in a white robe. Is that with the, due to the association of peace, basically? Yeah, and his uh, sainthood. Uh, He's right. Right. Yeah, like you see, I mean, again, this is why like a lot of Christian monarchies just had either of the coat of arms or in the case of France, just a field of Florida de lis on a field of white, basically. It, it's, it's, it's all hearkening back to like the Christian, the, the idea of a Christian monarch has like a pillar of peace, basically. And also um, to the fact that it, if you have a white flag, that's less of it that you have to die. In white, it, white um, fades, like that's why, or like that's why the Dutch flag went from um, blue, white, orange to blue, white, red. Um, and like obviously, it's very, very hard to actually um, to actually like clean. Uh, at a very basic level. Um, yeah, which is why clothes, with some exceptions, don't tend to be white, but flags that don't get dirty as much are often white. And and, and since we're all talking about colors, I mean, to, point, to, 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 to be the absolute pedant that I am, there is no such thing as a color white in, the, in heraldry, it's silver. <laughs> just so it does, just so it's simpler to, just so it's slim, it's simpler to clean. I mean, this is such an issue that uh, the one of the coat of arms of like of like Friesland, which is 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 like blue white on the uh, on like diagonal stripes, blue and white. There's hearts inside the white. Uh, in some renditions, there's also hearts inside the blue stripes. And the hilarity is that this coat of arms is sometimes depicted with the white uh, with the white uh, banners being basically silvered because apparently they failed to realize that that was that was how it was in the medieval ages they didn't like leave the the pay to like really symbolize that that it was white it was supposed to be white it was the color actually used was silver so much that it, that in french heraldry and other heraldries white is referred to as silver basically and hence, Argent. Yeah, and is considered a metal rather than a color or a cloth. Yeah, color. and 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 it being a metal is important for for the rule of tinctures, but that's a it's a different thing. Other episode. Yeah, we can get into that sometime. Uh, yeah, so I mean, we've now gone back on to like explaining her, uh, explaining the heraldic period, the court period, by explaining like the Spanish ceremonial. Now on to the Viennese phase. So the Viennese phase is 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 the is is the last and uh, can I say I I can say most famous uh, phase because it I, I think I think by the time of the we should probably say when um, the so we, you know we we can, I think I think it's reasonable to count it as from the sort of end the the middle of the latter half of the 18th century so you know 1770 ish you know uh you know think maria theresia joseph and so forth right the the world is in a sense moving away from from dynasty and so that doesn't mean they lose their passion for art but sort of the object of the uh, art goes from the dynasty to the city of Vienna in particular, but there's there is of course a lot of art all over the empire. So that they, they spend, I they spend, you know, Vienna is the, the the city of musicians, and they spend a lot of money on the opera, and later in the nineteenth century, on the the symphony, the, the, because you know that you start having concert culture, and 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 the Austrians. Are very keen on having concert culture be centered 
around um, Vienna, which is also why, you know, when the middle, when, when more and more people can afford to go to the concerts, the music that is played, you know, because you want, you want, you know, this that's the time when you can really start having a classical music that music from back in the day is popular because people who are now newly attending the concert want to actually know about what it is they're going to be hearing. So every concert house figures out that, yeah, what we're going to play is we're going to play the first Viennese school, Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, the classics. And so that, so, and so, and then all the music, so that sort of, so all over Europe, all the concert halls are playing the Viennese school. And then Vienna becomes the center of music. And then there's a lot of painting and architecture as well going on. And they're very keen. So, you know, they build the, the famous Musikverein in Vienna. And they spend a lot of money to keep that going. I, th I, th I, think, I think somewhere along there, there's a sort of a transition from focus on visual art to music, sort of being the big thing in Vienna. Is that because it's like non-replicable? Um, so like each performance is particular, like you can't record a uh, performance at this point. So it's, whereas with a painting, you can to some degree reproduce it more easily. Um, so it, would you think that's like a, a result of artistic trends or, or um, because of like, uh, like the fact that it's more expensive basically? Like it's more, it's more prestigious in this way. I I, I think it's because uh, the the bar of entry is is lower, right? Because in this period, you still have to be r reasonably wealthy to you know buy and s own art, right? But with you know right, the the they're building you know because before as you had you had to be in, invited to the court opera performances, but now anyone can buy a ticket to see the symphony. And so that becomes sort of the main expression, especially because by this point, the, the monarchy and the court are less and less the dominant group in society. So it's the sort of the middle classes and anyone who can afford a ticket that starts holding sway. Oh, so it's like uh, presenting yourself to society sort of thing. Yeah. That would make, that would make much more sense, I think. Um... Also, because uh, painting painting goes abroad, Paris becomes the center of visual art. Oh, okay. So then they, um, I mean that this is also then when you get like Mozart and so forth. I mean, I think most of the great uh, Baroque and like uh, Romantic musicians were in Austria, like in Vienna or Bavaria. Um, Wagner obviously had his like massive. Um, like he did all of his stuff in Bavaria and like there's the Munich Munich uh, stuff, which obviously is very close to to Vienna. Um, Brahms is in Vienna, Beethoven. And and even 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 if you go later, even if you go into the twentieth century, you still have Mahler and Strauss and 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 all that, which are sort of the pinnacles of the of the concert culture but i mean even i think some even to this day like vienna is massive in in music mm. right i mean by this period it, it's not the the habsburgs themselves that are the big the big players yeah you can interpret it as like like uh, still in fact like it's uh, I mean, but, but I, th I, th I think i think the viennese and concert culture and, and all of these things lie on the foundation that was built on because if you Habsburg have, courtly art because if you consider it it's still like trying to show a kind of unity between everything like in a even even now that it's easier even in this time period that it's easier to like go into an opera house it's like a representation of all of society still united under the Habsburgs be it as diffuse and indirect as it may be Maybe I'm reaching a bit in there, but uh, simple. Uh, yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, that makes sense to me. This idea that um, the opera, especially because like um, these opera halls are also then used as music halls. Um, so I think it there is definitely um, 
sense in which music was was like a social unifier um because obviously like most places did not have you know you don't have the omnipresence of music um which like is just kind of noise at this point for most people um i think having seeing as we've gone through sort of the whole history of the heraldic period cordly art period viennese period um i think we can probably wrap up this episode um yeah i think that's a that's a that's a reasonable place to leave it and um do do you have any other things to say no i think that 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 pretty much has us covered okay um yeah so this has been monarchism unfiltered i'm i am i'm the cause this has been bronze good night good night Uh,